Vesna Radnich uh, from the uh, Horota Waka Hoi Club in, uh, in Gisborne, New Zealand. Uh, it's on the North Island. And um, today we'll have uh, the CORA uh, video conference series uh, committee, uh, Eric Ages from Fairway Gorge, Leanne Stanley from Kelowna, and Val Simmons from, uh, um, <laughs> I forgot the name of your club, Val, I'm sorry. How nanny. Uh, how, how nanny. nanny. <laughs> In Montreal. Uh, and we'll be moderating. Uh, we'd like everybody to, to uh, mute their microphones during the course of the presentation and submit their questions by, uh, by chat. Uh, if you've got uh, a particularly complex question, you can raise your hand and, and then we can have, the, uh, have you turn on your mic and you can ask the question directly. Um, but, but otherwise, please uh, mute yourself and uh, submit questions uh, via chat. Um, also, uh, as you may have noticed, the, uh, the meeting's being recorded and we'll be posting it on the Cora uh, YouTube page and, and also the uh, Cora website. Um, so by remaining on the call, you're consenting to any contribution that, contribution that you may make to the call uh, being, dis being uh, displayed publicly. And uh, you won't re receive any compensation for that. Uh, that may include your name as it appears on your uh, image if, uh, if you uh, speak and the, uh, and the image uh, turns to your, your uh, particular uh, screenshot. Okay, so I'd like to hand it over to Leanne and she'll uh, introduce uh, Vesna a little bit more completely. Thank you. Hey all, excited to have everyone here this afternoon as we hopefully are rolling into spring coming out of this cold, uh, cold phase here in Canada. Um, we're super excited to have my good friend Vesna from New Zealand come join us today. I met Vesna on the race course at my very first sprints in 2008. And ever since then, um, we've been trading places. So 2008, she beat me. 2010, I beat her. 2012, she beat me. And we just seem to go back and forth. So it's quite, it's developed into this lovely friendship. And I'm so excited that she's able to join us today. But before I let her um on to you folks we're going to start off with uh with a little video from the sprints the last sprints that we had in 2018 just to remind everybody what this is all about ladies and gentlemen we have the elite women's v6 500 final lane one hawaii lane two new caledonia lane three tahiti lane four aotearoa uh, lane five, Canada. Lane six, Australia. And they're away. That was a great start. They're already running on this race. This is a final coming down to the finish line, 500 meters. And there in lane four, it could be that team from Aotearoa again has managed to get themselves in front. If we think back to the heats when they were running, they won by maybe two or three canoe lengths. So this will be interesting to see how they go against the Tahitians who are in the canoe in lane three and to see what happens at that halfway mark. Because so far what we've seen with the Tahitians is when they've hit that halfway mark, they've just taken off. So this will be a great test for the uh, power of the New Zealanders and the stamina of the the Tahitians when they hit that 250 mark. Yeah, absolutely. Lane four has got a really good pace on at the moment. They've just got this quick long happening where they're just pulling the water really fast, making sure that that the momentum class. stays. Uh, the Tahitians have a longer stroke, but they are pulling longer through the water so that they're getting more momentum on their waka um, so that they pull. But now that they've hit the 250 meter mark, there are two seats ahead. But let's watch these Tahitians start kicking now as they make their way past the 250 meter mark because Aotearoa is looking at that and responding with a bit of a kick and really pushing it now to make sure that their waka comes ahead as they make their way to the finish line. And then there's a bit of a fight there for third place too. Out there in lane five, uh, we have the Canadians in lane uh, three. Uh, we have on lane two the New Caledonians, they're trying for third position, but at the moment it's the team from Aotearoa, New Zealand. They're there in lane four, they've picked up their rate just a little further as they come down to the finish line. There's maybe 75 metres to go, and it uh, looks like that they've increased that half a canoe length lead. There might be about three quarters of a canoe length in front now, and the Tahitians are trying, but I don't think they're going to catch the New Zealanders. As they make their way to the finish line, there it is. Lane number four, Aotearoa New Zealand will take the gold medal for the V6 500 metre elite women's 
2018 final. And in second place, it looked like it was Tahiti. And third place, looked like it was out there in lane two, which was New Caledonia. But no, don't quote me on the third Canada. place. What we do know is that the elite Anyways. Just to get people excited about what, what sprints are. But our Canadian women um, got the bronze in that race. It was a tight finish for sure. Um, we just snuck past New Caledonia. So... On that note, now that we're all excited from our last sprints, um, I'd love. Here's Vesna, and she has. Um, if you haven't found her on Facebook before or on the net, she is the international paddling coach. Um, you can find her on her website. You can find her on Facebook. Um, but she shares freely so much Waka knowledge that it's we all benefit from her. So I am so excited to welcome her to our core off the water series. We tried to hook this up last year, but it just didn't happen. And so when I messaged her, she got back to me with like, like 30 seconds. So Vesna, thank you so much for being here. And uh, yeah, 65 of us are here right now and there's still more coming in. So it's all yours, girl. Kia ora, um, to Pukira Timonga, Ko Waikotu Te Awa, Ko Tainui Te Waka, Ko Mania Poto Te Iri, Ko Hangatiki Marae, Kia ora, Kina Tato, Kina Tato, Kina Tato To. So just uh, Nā Mihi, a big thank you to uh, all of you for being available today. Thank you, Leanne, and to Rob, and to Eric, and to Valerie, for the opportunity for today. Um, yes, I've been fortunate um, to know Leanne since 2008 Worlds, so that's a good, what, 14 years of paddling friendship. And that is the one thing that I, the one of the main reasons I love the sport is because of the friendships that you build around the world. And you get to rekindle those friendships every two years of the world sprint by last year. So uh, just a big, huge thank you. Um, a big thank you to you all, just again, for making yourself available. I hear that the sprint season is opening up very soon. You've got a couple of races on the calendar. So what a great way to begin the sprint season with a few little tips and um, paddling tips to help you all. So just um, a bit about me. I've been paddling about 20 years. Um, I live in New Zealand in a place called Gisborne. I'm a mum of two babies, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. I'm proud of them because they both go to Māori speaking schools, so they speak Māori, English and Croatian, which is my other background. Um, I learnt to paddle in Australia, Sydney. I fell in love with it because I said to the coach that I was hearing a and when I paddle, I can't wear them. And she said, not a problem. We'll just put you in at the caller. And I'm like, sweet, what does the caller do? They're like, okay, you call every 12 strokes, you call a hut, and then we change sides. And that's the reason I fell in love with it, because she didn't have my hearing disability be a disadvantage. She just looked at me and said, how can we make it work? So I'm really passionate about the sport, not just at competitive level, but at entry level. I find a way to make it work, to include everybody, because it's one of the few sports that is inclusive. We now have the adapted division in the sport. So yeah, I've been paddling 20 years. Um, I lived in Australia, learnt over there, got homesick, came home, and then I learnt that if I stopped the drinking and cut back on the partying a little bit, I could become a good paddler. So I let go of some of those recreational habits and um, the Queen became quite passionate into the sport. I started excelling in New Zealand and then I went to Tahiti and I was like average. And it's just that's just culture shock for me because in New Zealand doing well, but I go and race over in Tahiti and Hawaii and did average. So at that point, I was like, no, I want more. So 210, I won the New Zealand title and I wanted to win the world title. So about 2011, I moved over to Tahiti because back then they were the best in the world and to be the best, you've got to learn from the best. So damn, I had to go and live over there and I loved it and I fell in love with it even more because it made me realise that 
it wasn't just about the paddling, the technique, the training. It was the connection that they had. Um, they had absolute respect for the culture. They had respect for the va'a, for the people. And the best way they explained it to me was, I said, what does paddling mean to you? And they said, it feels like when we put our paddle in the water, that our ancestors are coming through the paddle, through our arm and into our body. And as we're pulling, we're pulling with them because they've got that absolute connection of who they are and where they're from. Look at the Canadians. You have a strong background in water sports. It's your natural genetics. And so that's what I really learned about the Tahitians is that connection. And so then I went on to come to Canada 2012 and won the world title. And that's almost 10 years ago. Um, so it's just been an amazing experience. 10 years on, my passion has been more now to give back to others and share the knowledge. Now, the things I share with you, they're not 100% that way. They are just the things that have helped me to become the paddler I am today. So the stuff I share is just the stuff that has helped me. Just one moment, just one moment, sorry. Like all true Zoom, Zoom meetings, our children, our pets love to join us. So no, by all means. And yeah, it was, um, it was a fantastic event for those that weren't able to make Calgary in 2012. It was um, an absolute joy to be able to host the world sprints in Calgary. Um, there were so many moments in that for so many people um, over that week that will stay with many of us forever. And it was, uh, yeah, anyways, it was, uh, it was cool to see Vesna knowing that her training, she'd taken it to that next level and moved um, to learn from the best of the best. That's kind of where inspiration hit me as well um, to kind of carry on the journey that I'm on. And yeah, Vesna, <laughs> I hope your kiddo's okay. <laughs> it's all good. I still remember meeting you. I still remember talking to you. I just, yeah, I, I can never remember, by the tent, up by the back where we had all the country tents, I can remember meeting you there. So just your inspiration back to me then and you're still an inspiration because I do follow your journey a lot. So just thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so that was my little bubba. Um, so yep, 212 won the world and then I wanted to give back and give more. Now I thought once I had babies, I stopped paddling, but no, that doesn't happen. You just keep paddling. So that video you just watched was 2018 Worlds. At those Worlds, I was six months pregnant with my baby girl. Um, baby and I made finals in the V1 500 Master Women. And we came back with three silver medals. We went on to do the ITOR, which is the 14 kilometre rudderless race came in the top 10 and a second place in the master women. And um, my baby, I talked to baby a lot when I raced. She was the one that, how do you say, dictated when I could push or when I couldn't. But what the appreciation I had was living in Tahiti had taught me about the connection that when you're paddling, you're paddling with your ancestors, you're paddling with the water. So I was able to incorporate that into the paddling. But moving forward, I'm here today to share with you some of the sprints, um, secrets and tips. And I guess Leanne asked us about the sprints because in New Zealand, the sprints is our biggest event of the year. It's for six days. It runs from 7 a.m. in the morning till 4 p.m. every day. And we've got an average of 50 races every day. The youngest is up to five years old. The eldest is 80 two years old. Um, we have up to 45 open women teams. I think there were 36 master women teams. Just to give you a bit of a gauge of the level that it is in New Zealand. And the reason it's so popular over that time is it's done over the Christmas break, the summer holidays. 
that most people are taking breaks from work, kids are on school holidays, and it gives them something to do over the summertime. Our little town, Gisborne, Horotuakahoi, we have won the Club of the Year for about the last five years. And at the World in Tahiti 2018, we won the Club of the Year at the World Championship. And it's largely due to the fact that we have a small little town, one set of traffic lights, and we're a water-bounded little town. And our children need something to do on the school holidays. And we are what we call a lower social economic town. So money is not readily available to go and take kids out to all the sports and things that are out there. And Waka Amo was one of those sports that was able to provide at a lesser cost. So therefore, a lot more children got involved. It also created water safety, water knowledge, and also brought the cousins, the uncles, the aunties, the families all together. Because while one parent might go to work, the other parent might take the other three or five to, to training. So it grew in the town because of the inclusiveness of all ages. So um, the same how the went season is quite big here in New Zealand. It does take over the calendar. We have 7,000 registered paddlers in New Zealand and about 5,000 people attend the six-day New Zealand Sprint event. That's just the ballpark of how big it is. We do have our long-distance races, but Sprint is big because it's inclusive of all people. So that's a bit about the sprint season here. So they've given me, your coaches have given me a bit of a list of things that they would like to go through. If you have any questions, could I ask you to write them down or if they need to be answered straight away, wave your hand and I'll try to answer them the best I can. If I can't give you an answer straight away, I'll do a bit of research and send through. Is that okay? Any questions so far? No, nope. cool. Okay, so when I'm teaching about paddling, I usually start with the technique of paddling. And we've got so many great coaches out there that are giving us tips and tools to be able to become more effective with paddling. So again, the stuff that I share with you is not right or wrong. It's just the things that have helped me. So... When I teach about paddling, I get us to start with the first thing that steps onto the boat, which is our feet. When our feet are placed in the most effective way, that will generate the rest of the power that travels up through the boat. Your foot placement is the first and most important thing when you're paddling. When I place my feet, I find the flattest part of the butter or the outrigger. Why do I find the flattest part? So that my feet can be nice and flat. If I take my foot up to the side, it's going to make my ankles roll, which is going to cause a discomfort in my leg. It's really important that you first start with a strong placement or foundation in the boat. So what I've got, I've got a chair behind me. I'm just going to step back and show you what it looks like. So here you have, so when I go to paddle, I put one foot in front of the other. I find the flattest part of the vata. I don't roll outwards because then that'll cause my knee to go inwards. I find the fattest part. When I go to push, I push from my heel. Why do I push from my heel? is because you have a main artery going up here into your groin and that artery goes to your heart. You have four valves going to your heart. One this way, one this way, one down here, one down here. I don't know if any of you have had to have a, um, a dye test done on your heart to check the heart. Usually when they do the dye test, they'll put the dye in the groin because that's one of the main arteries to the heart. So when you're paddling, we need to make sure that we're looking after those arteries, that we're getting that blood pumping. When you push from your heel, you're driving the power up through to the artery. Also, when you push from the heel, you're going to set off this muscle. It's called your calf muscle. 
your calf muscle can handle three times your body weight. If you paddle and push with your toes, you're going to set off shin splints, which is quite a discomfort feeling in paddling. And it also means that you're walking like this. We want to drive from our heels, create a movement that our body already does in everyday life. It's really important that the first part of the power come from the heel. It will come a bit from the front of the feet, but generate the first lot of power from here. Do that, you're helping the artery. You've got the calf muscle helping. The next muscle that's gonna help, help, is the quad. This one has four muscles. If we don't use the lower part of our body, we are stopping one of the strongest and one of the biggest muscles from helping us. 80% of your power is here, 20% of your power is here. Just look at the size of the muscle. We want to generate these ones first, combine it with the top one, and then you'll release a lot of power. But if we only use the top half, we're limiting the bottom half. Any questions so far? Okay. So how do we connect the next bit up? We've got the heel. We're generating the power. We're pushing off from here. But then how do we get a bit more from this bit here? It's really simple. You take the hip, you rotate it forward. Then you take the heel and pull it back. Take the hip, rotate it forward, push from the heel to pull back. Now it's important when you're rotating the hip that you're not lifting the hip and then sliding forward. Because if you do that, it means you're going to do this with your paddling and probably push your knees inwards. When you rotate the hip, you just rotate it straight ahead. I'll show you again. From here, taking the hip, rotate it. Pushing from the heel, pull back. Rotate, pull back. Now, people go, so what do you do with the knees? Which way do they go? So I want you to think about when you walk. When you walk, do we walk like this? Do we walk like this? Or do we walk like this? We walk like this. So what you want to do is kind of transfer what you do into everyday life into your movements of paddling. So what do I do? I rotate the hip. See what happens to this leg? What it's doing is opening up to give me more reach. If I do this when I open up, I'll collapse. And meaning I'm walking like this. If you open your hip, let that one go, you're going to get more reach. It's almost like standing up, reaching for the ground to get something. You're stronger like that than like that. So when I do it, I rotate the hip. The knee goes out, braces to the side. This knee goes out to the side as well to lock in a good reach. If you let your knee go like this and try and reach, you'll wobble. Let that knee go right up against the butter. And as you pull back, watch what happened to this knee. Come back to the center line. Reach out, and then it comes back to the center line. Same with this side here. Pull, and then it comes back to the center line. Don't force it to stay out because then it's going to be a little sore and um, pain in your hips. Just open the hips to reach forward and then let it come back to its natural position. Any questions so far? Making you think? If you want to practice it, just go practice it. Grab a chair because sometimes people show you and then you're like, hang on, I want to try it. So I'll show you the other side. So I'm putting one knee forward. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to rotate and then pull back. So 
the greater the pull, the greater the power. So what I mean by that is, if you sit on the edge of your seat and you try and do it, you're only going to go so far and you're going to rub those bone muscles raw. Because if you're sitting on the edge, you can only go so far. I don't know if you've seen those top teams, they do this nice, big, long power. If they try to do it on the edge of their seat, they'll only get so far. To be able to get more power, you've got to sit back on your seat, rotate the hip, and then pull back. Rotate, pull back. Sorry. Sitting on the seat, rotate, pull back. So the more you rotate, the more power you're going to generate. If you're sitting on the edge of your seat, you're limiting your power. Sit on your seat to generate as much power as you can. So then you're like, okay, so I've got these hips working. How am I going to connect the upper body down to the lower body? Well, the hips are the connecting, what we say, connecting element. So if the hips are the connecting element or the driving force, you need to let the hip help dictate the rest of the body to move forward. So what I mean by that is use the hip to return the shoulder rather than return the shoulder, then return the hip. It's a disjointed movement. Use the hip to help the shoulder to set up. Use the hip to help pull the panel through. Use the hip to help the shoulder return, then use the hip to help pull the panel through. If you do that, it's more of a natural movement. So for example, if you did boxing, you wouldn't stand in boxing and go, no, we use our hip to do it. In hockey, they, hockey, they don't just stand there and pull, they use their hip, golf, the same thing. They're not just standing with their arms and then their legs. They're using their hips, their legs, to generate the force. So the same without pedaling. So the other thing people ask about is the upper body. What happens with your arm? So here's the thing. If you sit up, you go to pull, and then you bend your arm, when you haven't completed the stroke, that tells me you're using your arms. The moment your arm bends, that's when your arm take over the stroke. The longer you keep your arm straight, the stronger the power. So an example might be, if you reach something from the ground and you pull it up just with your hands, it's not as powerful as keeping it long and pulling it. Pull here is stronger than so the same apply, uh, applies to your paddling rather than pulling in. Now your arm is going to need to bend to get the blade out. But rather than try and physically bend it and then return it, I say let it come out and then return it. If we try and chop it to the front too quickly, we might impact the boat run. We want to place, pull, and then let it come out, so I do a little slight raise, and then return. So, I like practicing it on the floor, because then it stops me doing this. The quickest way from A to B is in a straight line. This will make your waka go forward. This will make your waka go up and down. 
You want to keep a control of your top head. When you place it, place it in. Pull it back. What should I do on my return? So you notice I don't grip on the return, because if I grip, it'll shorten the return and make a lot of work. When you loosen it, you enable yourself to lengthen and rotate. Okay, posture. So when people are paddling, you see this happen, you see that. In here, we have our heart, we have our kidneys, we have our lungs, we have our biggest oxygen capacity, we have our spine, our vital organs live in here. If we do this during a race, it's going to impact on our vital organs. We're probably going to get about 70, 80% out of them because we're hunching, we're cutting them off from being able to do their job. When you sit up, strong posture, your vital organs can be at their best for you. You also have your spine that runs up here. On each of those vertebrae, you have muscle fibers running off them. That muscle fiber here might be talking to this knee. That muscle fiber there might be talking to that shoulder. If they're all sitting on top of each other and they're good and they're strong and they're straight, they can communicate to your body. But if we start to bend those vertebrae, that's going to interfere with that communication and that's when it's going to start developing some extra little movements in our paddling. It's important that we take care of our spine and keep it strong. And with doing it that way, you'll become a, more effective with your paddling. And I learned that a lot after I had back surgery. So on my back, I've got 21 stitches. I had that surgery after the World 2016. I grew that much taller, yes. But if anything, I learned the importance of having the posture strong. I learned that if I let it go one way or the other, it's going to impact on my paddling. Leading up to the world, 2016 was really painful. Really, really painful. I was using training as a way to fight off the pain in my back. So your spine and your posture needs to be strong to be effective for you to paddle. You don't have to have a 20 pack on your body, 20 the abdominals. It's about switching them on inside. Just have a strong core inside. You can have the little extra things outside to keep you cuddly and warm, but it's switching that stuff on inside. Because you look at some of those top paddlers, they're not all these little skinny things. They're actually quite solid because they know how to switch everything on here. Keep this strong, then you will get more of an effective stroke with your paddling. I see lots of smiles and laughing. That's really cool. Um, I can open up if you want to some questions. Oh, how do I change my foot position? I just saw that one. Good, good question. Might be a bit hard to see forward, so I'm going to show you side. Paddle, paddle, hop, hop. That's one way. This is another way that a team does it. And in sprint, because you've got to control the bounce, sometimes we do this. Hop. Hop. Did you get that? So when the hut call was made, we brought our feet together then we changed over. Because sometimes we would find when we did a hop and we all changed, then it went bounce. By sliding, then together, then changing, created a bit of a, a smoothness. Did that help? Cool. Anyone got That's anything? Awesome, doesn't it? Do you, if you want to move into some of the sprint specific type stuff, like 
everything you've talked about is about generating power, which is so key in all paddling and sprints, especially. But if we move into more sprint specific stuff, I know you've got hours worth of knowledge that you want to share. That's the basics. Yeah, that's, I just want to touch that. So sprints, I don't know if you've watched rowers and kayakers, they all do different strokes and each of those strokes have a purpose. So for example, when you go to start the boat up and out of the water, you want to go straight into a fast or a power. No, you do the stroke that would help to lift the boat up and out. You want to imagine that you're like a jet ski and you're revving the boat out. So what most people will do is they'll do three to four full blade strokes. So what that means is they're going to set up. I won't be able to do it because it's too shallow for me. They set up and then they do a full pull past their hip. Then they return. They do another full one past their hip, but a faster return because the boat's already up and going. Then they'll do another third stroke a little bit faster in a faster return because the boat's already up. The purpose of the first three or four is to get the boat up and going. Once it's up and going, then we've got to move into a stroke that's fast and just going to keep it humming along for a little while. And so that's the one they might call a wind, a speed, a rate, a fast. So for that one, that's one of the few strokes that uses a lot of the arms. Because you're using the little muscles, the movement's a lot faster. Once you start bringing these ones in, the stroke starts to slow because you need more power. So usually after the first three, they go into what we call a wind or a fast. So for this one, you've got to make sure your knees are braced out to the side, not locked, just braced out. You need to lock forward. I don't know if you've heard people say that. Why? Because this one's quite fast, if you're moving up and down, it's going to make the boat go up and down. Yes, you need to lock your body forward, set it up, and pull it to about your knee and take it out. Pull to your knee. Now, why do I say to about your knee? Because as soon as you pull past your knee, you're asking this one and this one to help with the stroke, which is actually more of a power and open stroke. The fast or the wind is to get the boat fast and winding up. I'll show you what that looks like. Sit up and then wind. I'm doing it really slow. Now I'll show you what it looks like fast. Zesna, do you want me to show a video of a start from Horatura in 2021 sprints? So they can see it. Do you want me to show a start of a race from your club team from uh, 2020? <laughs> okay. Fast. It is really yeah. fast. It's really fast. And when you're locking your body, it's preventing that bouncing of the boat. It's important to lock the body when you're doing it. It's important the entry. You can choose. Some people do a half blade, some do three quarter, some do a full, full blade for the wind or the rate. For me, I've been teaching my one a full blade every stroke. Why? Because if we say it's a half blade, you need to probably put black tape or some tape on your paddle so you know that you're all entering it and at exactly the same place. If you do half, three quarters, that's a lot for your brain to think about. I just say to full blade every stroke. Then they don't have to think about those variables, but it's what works for your team. If you go, hey, we do the half and it hums, it gets us going. Do that. The stuff I share is the stuff that's helped me, but it's about you finding out what works best for your team. Cool. So we do the first three, and then we go into our wind. We usually do this for about two sets, and then we go into what's called a power or an open. So what happens there is, we open up our body, sit up a bit more, rotate, and then pull back to our hip, bringing in our hip. So the wind comes down at the knee, 
the power or the open comes out of the hip. Now it's called the power or the open because it's got lots of power. Then there's another stroke that some people bring in after a couple of sets and it's called a long. So a long, simple, pulls past your hip. So wind, fast, comes out at the knee. Power, open, comes out at the hip. Long goes past the hip. So the long also uses a lot of leg. Long, long. It's generally a little bit slower in the pull because of the range of movement you're using and the amount of power that it uses. Any questions so far? That's just three strokes only. Vesna, I'm, yep, no. I'm, I'm wondering if Leanne has that video queued up. I think it would be really useful for the audience to actually see it in real time. Uh, so if you don't mind, Leanne, do you have that queued up and we can watch it? I do. Oh my God. <laughs> Now, Premier Woman, W6, 1500 metres final for the 2020 Wakama Nationals. Here's we turn to lane one. Kayara Hitoa, Horota, opening pace. Quite astonishing. Into lane two, we have Tanifa Roto Wahine. Into lane three, Manus and Jemimas. Kitera Tuafa, Yahuke Mai, Takarapu, Otepai Rangi, Ane Kopoe Tiare, Etahiunga, Kaparongon Ri, Tainita, Kitera Tuarima, Opisi, Casey, Tepua Inano, Nakite Ara Tua Ono, O Maroro, Etewaka Paunamu, Wetekia, Ara Tua Fitu, Bairu Ote Onu, Ara Tuawa. All of these teams uh, have champion paddlers in them and they all know what they want to do. This is a premier women's 1500 metres, so that is five turns in this race as Horo Tawakahoi make the approach to this first turn out there in lane seven as well. It looks like Wetekia from Tawakahama, no sweat. There from Kiwi Campbell, she's just let that waka go straight around and they are already out by at least three or four um, strokes, which means that waka is probably going to be one waka length ahead as they leave that 250 metre mark. Cool. Thanks, that was cool. That was really cool to see that up there. So th thank you for that, Leanne. So you can see how these are different strokes. The big thing also to notice is how everyone, about 90% exactly a mirror of each other. So the top teams, you'll notice they're very similar. The teams that are not at the closest lanes of lane one, you'll notice that they've all got their own little thing going on in the waka. It's really important that when you're doing your different strokes, that all of you are practicing it, you're filming it, you're getting coaching from it, but you also can see yourself because you want to have six exactly the same. When you have six exactly the same, entering and exiting and moving exactly the same, it just flies effortlessly. But once somebody decides, well, I'm going to pull longer, it's going to impact on the rest of the boat. So it's really important that you all do exactly the same thing. So I've just got some questions coming in. Can I just have a look? I just want to see the questions. Sorry. So the okay. questions are about starting with the blade in the water, in the water, out of the water, or when would it be appropriate to do either? Good point. So say you're here and the you've got the wind behind you and it's pushing your boat forward then yes, you would probably put it in to brace it, to stop it moving forward. If you're um, if it's the lake and it's not moving so far forward, yes, close to the water. You want to start, sorry, you want to start close to the water 
so that when that goes cool, you put it straight in. If you've got one person here and the other person up here and you call a go, the one that's up here will get a delay in their pull. So when you set up your start, you've got to do whatever seat one is doing. So if seat one's got theirs here, you start yours there. If seat one's got theirs there, you either talk to her or him to bring it down, or you simply all start in exactly the same place. So if you start at the same place, that pull will happen at the same place. But if someone does something on their own, it's going to cause that little jerky, that lull feeling. Does that help? Can you um, grab the other questions? What other questions were put up? It was the same question. <laughs> yeah, it was the same question. Sorry? It was the same question. Oh, okay. It's a good question. Sometimes I just take it for granted, like, yep, that's how you do it. <laughs> Not till you bring it up, then I actually go, hang on, slow down, bring it back to simple stuff. Um, so I just did a couple of strokes. Those are three strokes. I used to teach them just those, and then the finish stroke used to be a collective of all three of them. I now used to say that the reason you do the three deep, the wind, the open, the powers, and the long is to build your finish stroke, which is at the finish, and that finish stroke is a collective of all those strokes. Those strokes are warming you up for your finish. So with that in mind, when you've got your 500 meter race, I used to think you just get in and paddle till you can't paddle anymore and get past that finish line. No, I learned really soon, five years later, that you need a race strategy. It's not just about going in and going. So we we're talking before about those three deep or those four deep. The purpose of that is to get the boat up and going. Then you've got the wind or the fast or the, um, we call it a penny. The purpose of that is to hum the boat and keep it humming along. Then you can do a power or an open strip, and that's to generate power and push you through. And then you might need a long, and that long is to really open up and breathe and give you a bit of recovery. And then you might need to kick in that wine stroke just before the halfway to kick you up and wake you up. Then you might need to chuck in a long for a bit of a breather, then an open, then a finish. So I know I've rattled on some strokes, but I'm rattling them off just to explain that you need each of those strokes in a particular part of the race. There's no specific rule of how many, which one comes first, but depending on the team's um, build and the team's capability. So for example, open women, they do three sets of wines, then two sets of long, two sets of open, then they do a wind at the 250, one set along, two open, and then two sets of finish. But if I bring that to my master's team, they're like, no, we do two sets of wind instead of a three. We go into three sets of long. We do slightly different to what we do in an open. When you go into a J16, be ready to have a heart attack because they go far. They're little firecrackers. Their strategy would be slightly different to what you would get at a Golden Masters level. So it's about looking at the strokes, learning them, everyone doing the same, and then finding that blend that's going to help your team get from A to B the quickest. You need to test it because some people might say, oh, but we do better when we do four longs and two opens. Well, I say time it. When you time it, then that reassures you what works and what doesn't work. Um, it's important to build your 500 metre race strategy first. You see the turns races, but it's really important to lock in your 500 metre race strategy because your 500 metre race strategy will actually be what builds your turns race. So what do I mean by that? Well, usually with a 500 metre race strategy, You've got your first half, your zero to your 250 metre mark. That's usually your first half of your 500. And then from the 250 to the 500, that's your second half of your two, of your 500. So when this is locked in, 
you transfer it into your term flows. How do you do that? Well, what was the first half of your 500 now becomes the first half of your 250 and your first couple of terms. The last half of your 500 becomes the last half of your terms finishing part of the race. So it's really important that you lock in the 500 first before trying to build the strategy of the term. You still practice your terms while you're learning with sprint, but make sure you've got that 500 locked in first because that stuff will build what becomes the terms race. Cool. Was there a question? Were there some questions I missed? Yeah, Vesna. The question that we have is how, how do you ensure a quick switch over? So from side to okay. side, how do you ensure that it's quick and together? We do the fast changeover drills. So we have to just sit on the boat and do a fast changeover and just practice it. We do one side and then our caller would be paddling along and the caller would go up and it might call on the third joke up. So we would practice it in the boat. You think about the speed of your um, changeover has to be the speed of the return part of your stroke. So if you're doing the wind stroke or the fast stroke, it needs to be a fast changeover. When you're doing your power stroke, it's not as fast as a changeover as the wind. How do you also get faster is sitting in a chair at home and just practicing fast changeovers. So I'm going to stand up. There's another drill I do. My head might cut off, where I just stand there and I go like this. And then I'll say, ready, set, go. Then back to easy, then go. So how you become fast is by practicing it just off the land, on the land as well as on the boat. You'll get used to getting numbs in here, but it will help you to become faster. You want it to be like, you know, when you change the gear of a car, we don't go, which is what some people do when they do changeovers. You want it to become second nature. You're not even thinking about it. Oops, sorry. Does that help? Desna, oh. Desna, uh, I think during your during your overview of the strokes, the sort of uh, collection of strokes that you have, you did mention a finish stroke. And I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. So what do you mean by a finish stroke? So the finish stroke is those last two or three set at the end of the 500. We never used to have an exact thing that we called a finish stroke. It was what the team needed at that time. So sometimes our finish stroke would be a bit of a collective of a long and a wide because that's what we needed for the finish. Sometimes at the finish, we might have needed more power. So the finish stroke was actually a bit more of a power stroke. It's, it doesn't have it for me. I'm not saying it's for everyone. To me, it doesn't have its own name. It's a collective of whatever that team needs. It might be keep it light at the finish where you're actually doing more of a wind and we've done it that way one time and then another time we've needed to dig it deeper and become like a long but also a power at the same time it's that feeling that you get that you know that you need it for your team to do the finish to get to the end it's important that your set one knows how to feel what's happening behind and give them the team that give the team what they want. So you want someone in seat one that's going to set the whole team up. So for example, if you had someone quite small in one and then two, three, four, five, six with solid, strong girls, if that seat one decides to start going extremely fast, 
that's not going to be good for the rest of the team. Your seat one needs to look at the strengths that are in all those seats and go, what can I give my team that they can give back me power or have my back? They've got to remember that there are five other people that they need to pull in a way that their team's going to be able to pull and feel that they can give them power. So there's, no, there's a question in the chat saying, so who calls the strokes or if you're changing or is that a set plan or are you all just following seat one? So we, everybody's job to know the race strategy. That's the first thing. We don't put the pressure on one person because anything can happen out there. There's so much yelling that you might only hear the hut, but you missed what was the strategy because of the yelling. But if you know in your head, this is coming up, you can focus on that. So that's the first thing. Everybody needs to know the race strategy. Um, we usually have one, three and four. Between those two, one calls the hut and the other person calls the strategy just to spread the load. So usually between three and four. And how we do it, we'll paddle along and before the hut calls made, so I'll rephrase that. So how we do the calls is if a hut calls made and we've got another thing happening, another stroke we're moving into, on about the third stroke, the caller will say, next, long. So that by the time you reach your 10th or your 12th stroke, everyone knows that the next stroke is the long. The hut, paddle long. One, two, three, next, long, and then change. So when the change is made, they know what's happening. The biggest mistake people make is they wait for the hut call, then they tell you what's coming up, and that's quite stressful. You want to be calling the race strategy or the change way before it happens. Also, another trick we used to do, because some of people, as they get, more mature, so hearing can be a bit challenged, is um, we use tone. So long, power, wind, finish, long, power, hit. So the tones are completely different because I can hear a little bit. I can hear like not completely deaf. But the tones really help. Because if you hear a power, open, long, wind, finish, hip, it's too confusing. But if you hear hip, long, power, wind, finish, it helps you to and practice with the caller so that everybody knows what the tone of that caller is going to be. Did that help? Okay, there's another question that went in, a couple. Oh, I might have missed it. I think we're on everybody so far. Yeah, I think we've I got them all. all. Yeah, that was really helpful. Can I check in the silent tunes? So, um, when we're learning turns, it's so much to think about. You're like, what do I do? Do I do this? Do I do that? First thing, watch some video. Watch what people do in your seats. Look at different teams and see what they're doing. Then what we used to do, we'd get in the waka and we would do 20 turns on a 250-metre course without speaking. The only call that was made was a hut. So we didn't call when we were going into a turn and we didn't call going out of a turn. And the reason we did that, it's only about 40 to 60 percent, is so that we could individually focus on our job of what we needed to do in our seat three, in our seat two, in our seat one. Because I guarantee after doing 20 turns in silence, you'll know your seat what your job is and what works best for your team. You'll also know that if the buoy is here and the steer has gone too wide, you'll know what to do. If the steer has gone too close, you'll know what to do. You won't have to rely on someone talking to you. You'll be able to know, hey, he's gone in close, cool, I've got to do this. 
hey, you've gone a bit wider. Okay, I'm going to have to do this. Because it's about communicating within yourself as well as out there of what your job is to do in the term. So that's one of the things we used to do when we'd be practicing our term. And yes, of course, we would go through each seat's job just to clarify what they need to do before practicing it. What we also used to do is after that, everyone had to swap and practice the turn, even seat one. So what that did is the five others, it didn't matter who was in the steerer's seat, the other five were gonna do whatever it takes to help turn that boat. Because it takes six people to turn the boat, not the steerer. And it will bring your team to another respect level of each other when you all have to try the seat and then you're all doing whatever it takes to help that steerer to turn. You're not chucking the load on the steerer. You're not chucking the load on seat one. You're going, take any line in. We've got your back. We've got the front. We're going to do whatever it takes to help you turn. Then, yes, of course, you're going to need your specific twigging in that. That's okay. But it's also about learning to crawl, learning to fall over before trying to run too soon. That helped so far? Not too much information yeah. overlaid yet? No, that was really helpful. Blade sizes. The so people have been asking about blade sizes. That's the 12. That's the 10. They are all different blade sizes. I think this is the nine and a quarter. Back in the day, they used to use a 14 inch. So this is a 12. They used to use a 14 inch and it used to be wider. So usually in front, they use ones that are a bit wider and for the ocean, a little bit smaller. I don't say that there's one type of blade that you can use or should use, but it's about all of you as a team collectively similar, choosing one that's similar. You don't want to, and I'll say it doesn't work because one time I used my 12 and the rest of my team had nine and they had to ask me to drop it down because it was pulling at a different time. So as a team, you need to collectively try to find one that's similar. There is no right or wrong. It's about what works best for your team. There's also the, I don't know if you can see, the straight shaft. And then the bend. I prefer, and it's not a must, I prefer the straight shaft for the swim and the bend for the ocean. But like I said, there's not one specific one. It's about what works for your team. Does that help? I saw some questions coming in. You want to fire those questions away? The, the first one's from Sherry Hunt, who's a program coordinator at False Creek. It's, can you please uh, briefly go over the roles of each seat during a turn? Yep. For the turn, <clears throat> so, um, you would have seen in the videos, there's different things that you can do at the front. So seat one, I'll take it a step back. When you're doing your turns, keep the call simple. We usually only have three calls for the turn. So usually the first call is hang. That's where you hang. The second call, draw, where you draw it in. Third call, go, where you get out and you go. It's up to you as a team to choose your calls, but please just keep them simple for your whole team. So for us, we call a hang or a turn. So if a hang or a turn call, seat one either can on in from the front or they can hang from the side. They can either jab or on in from the front and pull it in or they can hang. Um, you, have to, you have to practice this one. You've got to be very quick and good at it. 
just be mindful that this pressure can sometimes snap the blade. So some teams put a spare blade in seat one for this movement. So it's up to you, make sure that you practice it. With the hang, I you think about the hang. If you hang like this, do you think that's, sorry, is that effective? That's hard. If you just brought it down to here and hang, you've actually got more control and break. This is harder on the body. This enables you to lock yourself more. Also, if you do this, you might tend to lean a bit more, which is going to put pressure on the armor. Hang on, it's the opposite way around for you guys, isn't it? I'll change sides just for you. Okay, so if you hang like this, you're going to more than likely put some pressure on the armor, pushing it down, which is going to make it harder to turn. Whereas if you sit like this, you've locked, you've got more control, and you're actually pushing the blade down rather than lunging the body and putting the weight on the armor, you push the blade down, which means you're not pushing on the armor, you're pushing the blade down to brace it. So usually when the hand calls me, see one does this, or that. When the jaw calls me, they, it's gonna be a bit hard for me to do here. They draw, but what you wanna do, you want to draw using your hip. You don't want to lunge to draw because if you do that, you're going to push on the ama. When you push it down, it makes it harder to turn. So when the draw call is made, you want to push it down, send the blade, the wash of water under the va'a, and what should happen? It should come out the other side. You don't want to push and press the water against the va'a because that doesn't help, you want to take that water and send it under the boat. Does that help so far? Yeah, you, you had the sides right the first time. <clears throat> you had the sides right the first time. Yeah. And then when a call is made, go, you simply get out and you go. Yeah. Hand or turn, jaw, go. Seat one, hang. Four, push down, push down, go. So usually going into a turn, we used to make seat one of the other side going into the turn. So when the turn call was made or the hang, seat two would have to come over to go in with seat one. Because if you have seat one, seat two, seat three, seat five, and possibly seat six, all on the other side, it's going to cause a bit of drag. So we try and keep as many as we can on the non armor side to keep the armor light. So going into a turn, we usually have the seat one on the armor side, seat two on the non armor side. Just before the turn's about to happen, usually seat two will come over or sometimes seat two will wait for the turn and then come over. But it's about practicing as a team and finding what works for you. Seat two's job is to make sure that the ama is really close to the buoy. We call it kiss the buoy. They almost become, seat two become like the handbrake. The other thing that handbrake is that back flips around. Seat two is to lock it in. So one thing I do, I should have had a video for this one, is when I used to be in two, I would come to the back of the seat and I would go hang and I would reach this right up again, the kiato, because there's so much shaking happening from it turning that it's hard for me to hold it out here. I used to just simply press it up against the kettle and that would give it that break and that brace. But it's up to you. I'm not saying that's the must. If you find coming away from the kettle is fine to help turn it, that's okay. For me, I used to just lock it in, turn, draw, go. 
Um, so now, so did you did you change the angle of your blade at all, depending on what the boat yeah. needed at from the front? Do it on the opposite side to you guys because I'm not used to. So when I would do a turn, so turn, I would drop it backwards, and I would just had to be under the water. Nothing was above. Because if this was about, it would cause a lot of shaking and it will stop it from turning. When it's right in, it just to, has to flip it over and jab it straight in. And then start to draw. And the, the, side, the, the side you're on now is the same as ours. Same as us. Oh, same? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So the side you're on now is what we do. Oh, sweet. That makes it better. Sorry, I didn't realize. Sometimes it comes out on the opposite side. So hang. Draw. Go. Now, notice feet, being in feet too, I had to change side. <coughs> because going into the turn, See, two is usually on the opposite side. So going into a turn, we go in. And then we're near at the buoy. Only I change. See, two. Turn. Draw. Go. And I would change over. So what do seats uh three four and five do so three job is to push the power through on the turn the longer you what you want to do is you want to have so much speed that your one and two is hanging and three and four are pushing it through right and only two draws and go if you come and start drawing too soon it's going to impact on how quickly it turns because the moment the blade comes out, the waka goes off. If you can hang for as long as you can, do so. And three and four's job is to pump it through. When they've pumped it through, you should only need to do one or two draws before you go back in. So three and four are pushing it through. Three and four need to be watching it and pushing through five they will do what seat one and two does so when that turn or that hen calls made they go and do that when the draw calls made they do it and then when the go is called go but sometimes one and two are quite strong but seat five doesn't even need to do any hanging or drawing they can generally just paddle right through um, with those arries, which are for the world, you may find they spin quite quickly. You may not need too much from five. So if you have the opportunity and you have fives over there or canoes that are similar to the world's standard, get out and try them because then you can see. So for us in New Zealand, we've got the mahi mahi and it sits quite low and it's heavy. So seat five does need to help. Bradley's, when we've been in them, seat five hadn't had to do anything. They've had, and in the Addy and in the Fi, I think seat five hung and then they did one scoop and they just started paddling. So every canoe is different. There's no one set way. Sometimes we've been in a Bradley where only seat two is hung. Everyone else is paddled. So it's just depending the dynamics of the uh, the build of the canoe and the dynamics of the team too, where their strengths are. But I just encourage if you can to hang longer than start drawing because the drawing movement will cause this and make it harder for your steerer. Whereas the hanging just creates more that smoothness. I think that's helpful. Sorry, go. That, that's helpful, yes. So when the call is made, the go call, what we would do, seat two would go over. They've got one of the hardest jobs. 
we would go like we were going to do a start and we would go one, two, three, hop, and then change. Now, the reason we did that is because if we didn't change, we would have been on the same side going in, going out, and kicking out. And that's quite um, a lot of work on the body. So we would go in on one way. And then when the call goes made, we would go one, two, three, hook, it changed, and so we're fresh going out. You can, if you want, stay on that side and not change over, but just know you would have probably done about 40, 50 strokes already on that same side. And if you want to get out of the block, it's about choosing what works. But you guys might go, hang on, we actually do better staying on that side going out. That's okay. Just test it. Time it. That will let you know if it's working. That helps so far? Were there some more questions that came in? Yep, there's one here, Vesna, that says some paddlers think they should learn the Tahitian stroke is fast to be faster. Is there really a different stroke that the Tahitians do compared to other folks? Well, you think of a lake. Do Tahitians paddle the same stroke in a lake as they would out in an ocean? It's about looking at your environment and paddling to be able to get the effectiveness out of that. So paddling 15 k's in New Zealand on the ocean would be like paddling 20, 25 k's in Tahiti because their water is light. The va'a as well. You've got to have a look. Is your va'a that you're using for the world, is it a sitting and low one or is it a sit on top? It sits on top a bit more. The Tahitians have the water and they've adapted their stroke to the water. So when you're looking at um, London, it's at the Olympics venue, the Windsor, Dorsey Park or something, it's a lake. So if you look at that and you apply a stroke, it's going to effectively make your Ari, your six man fly. What the Tahitians use in the Tahiti, when they're out in the ocean, you'll look, their stroke in the ocean is slightly different to what they use in the scrunts. They adapt to whatever the conditions are, whatever the va'a is. It's about you also finding the stroke that works for your team. So for example, I'll be honest, I did come back with quite a wide stroke from being over there, but for my team, they wanted me to cut that off and do it slightly different. And I could say, well, I'm the top one, I'm going to do it my way. But I didn't because it wasn't about me. It was about what's going to work for my team. And I'm replaceable. You're all replaceable. I wanted to do what my team needed. So I adapted and I changed slightly. It was hard mentally for myself, but thing is, I wanted it for my team. I wanted to win for my team. So I had to change slightly. So you may find that stuff that you did with one team, their style is slightly different to what brings you to another team. As long as it's making that boat move fast and using all the muscles effectively, then it will work. Yeah, and like, we've got our top paddler. So back in 2016, we had our top open wounds, women, I was a master by then, and we were all trialling for the elite team. Even though she was the fastest on the water, when it came to the team stuff, she actually missed out on the team, the elite team for the 515, because she wasn't adapting her stroke to the team. So it doesn't matter if you're the top or the fastest, it's about you as a paddler, what are you going to do to blend in with your team? Does that help? Very much so. And I think those are wise words from sprints to distance to life is that, you know what? The team is bigger than you as an individual. It doesn't matter if you're the top or the bottom, the team has to come first. Yeah. And it is that, and sometimes it's been a bit hard for me when I know that these other strokes work, but for me, it only worked for me. It doesn't always work for the other five, and I want to win with a team. It's more fun winning with a team 
than winning on your own. And I'm speaking from experience. I love more now winning with a team, winning with those that I coach than winning one on my own. It's just that feeling how beautiful it feels, that cohesion, that hit and that glide. And that's what makes it more enjoyable than an individual race. I completely agree. And this is one of the reasons why we're kindred spirits and we get along so well is we, we feel the same way about those kind of things that is we've been up to the top as individuals, but the value that we get and the the value, the purpose and the fulfillment we get from helping others and coaching others and seeing them thrive um, is a wonderful thing. And unfortunately, we're coming down to the end of our time with Vesna. Um, we've got a few announcements from CORE that we need to make, but does anyone have a final question or Vesna, do you have any final words for a couple of minutes? Yeah, I Any think we're putting everything. It's I've just got my little my little list that you guys gave me yesterday. Nothing else. No, I haven't seen anything. Is there anything else anybody else might have? All right, we got one from Sherry, and we'll see if we can answer this in you know three minutes or less. It says, what okay. about the time of season to train certain strategies? So it's like when we're just getting onto our cold water for a lot of us here in Canada, we're not going to be training the wine stroke at all because one, the water's cold and heavy and we're just getting back onto the water. So are there certain times or certain phases that you folks go through for training? It's depending if you've got races that are sprint specific. So like for us in the 9th of April, we have the world sprint trial for the one man. So at the moment, I'm having to reintroduce some of the sprint stuff. We usually do it. We start training for sprints hard out three months before the event. But I've got it on the 9th of April. So I'm not doing 100% sprints only because the 9th of April isn't where I want to peak. August is where I want to peak. So I'm doing some components of it but I'm continually moving through it. So when I say that, it might be a wine, then into a long, then into a power, but over 10 minutes. It's not until we get closer to May, June, about June, July, then I'd be doing 20 wine strokes, stop. 20 wine strokes, 20 long, stop. So it's closer to the event, um, not the venue, the event that you work. So 12 weeks out is where you want doing the most intense so at the moment you should be doing endurance so in the off season is endurance then the purpose of endurance is to build your paddle fitness up drop some weight if you need to weight drop the weight and build your cardiovascular fitness then you move into your strength phase so after you've got rid of the weight you know need you need to build some muscle strength so that's where you do your muscle or your strength phase then you move into your speed phase because you need your cardio fitness and you need your strength to be able to work on the speed and that's why that one comes last that speed stuff is about eight weeks 12 weeks before world and then you need to have a minimum of a week taper before the event not training up and then three days with a lady, you've got the world sprint, seven to 10 days of tapering off. That's your rest, that's your recovery. Because you want to rock up to world and be so amped up and ready to paddle rather than, oh, I'm so tired, I haven't had enough recovery. So it's important to have a training program, having three weeks on, one week off, three weeks on, one week off. When you get to the speed stuff, it's usually two weeks on, one week off because speed is quite intense. I'm talking fast because I know that you've got a bit of limited time left. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, one, one topic we touched on in our pre-meeting yesterday was um, how, how, uh, do you, how much do you train together in your set crew before an event? Yeah, you're talking about um, team training, crew training, then race crew training. Right. So we should our squad. I'll be honest, three times a week at the moment, two, three times a week. And that's with the same crew in uh, the race crew in your seats, in your race seats. We don't do that at the moment. We just focus on just we sit in any seat. Right. It's not till about probably. If we had an event coming up in three weeks, not a world event, mm -hmm. then we'd probably fall into our seat. 
but we usually sit in any seat. Right. It's not close to a race event that you do. So if you're doing worlds, it's at least 12 weeks out or you would already have your seats locked in 12 weeks out. Mm -hmm. But be willing to, if you have to, change seats. I've been at the world and then we've done the heats, we've done the quarter, the semis, and then the final, they said, obviously, you're going up to one. And I'm like, dude, but <laughs> that's team needs. So that's why we train in the different seats. But yep. yes, when you're facing your race crew, you do have your set seats. So just be willing, if you have to, to flick it around. We do at world level, you should be doing one man's. If you're wanting to be competitive and make finals, the one man needs to be a part of it. So when I was living in Tahiti, 90% of our training was on the one man. Because on the one man, you can work on the things that your coach says, open up, and you're like, yeah, I'm opening up. And then you hop on the one man, and you're like, oh, shoot, I need to open up a bit more. The one man keeps you honest. A paddler, if you've got a squad here that paddles just the six man, and then you've got a squad here that do better one man than six man, the ones that do one means as well will be a lot more confident when those conditions change to a team that only paddles the six men. That's important. The one man isn't about trying to show each other up and be faster. It allows them to do it with a rudder or rudderless. Rudderless is probably more for those that want to compete at rudderless. But the importance of the one means is to individually work on yourself and bring your strengths out and work on the things you need to work on rather than just on the six men, because if you go just six men and someone's had a crap day, they can bring that stuff to training. And also when you're on a six man and your coach said, reach more, reach more, you're like, I am, I am, but you can't feel it as much on a six man as when you jump over onto a one man. Okay, okay thanks, that was good. Yeah. That helped. Is there totally. anything else? Oh. There is so much else, but we're running out of time. And I'm thinking, I don't know about the folks here watching, but I would love to invite Vesna back for another session in the future. If she's, I'm kind of putting her on the spot here if she's interested, <laughs> but give me a, a thumbs up or a heart in the comments there. If that's kind of something you'd love to see. Yeah. And yep, they're coming in through. <laughs> oh, and uh, there is one question from Ning. I think there was a hand up. Oh, sorry. Uh, that was a uh, yes to come back. I don't know. Oh, okay. Know. Okay. Cool. But yeah, thank you so much for spending your Sunday afternoon with us um, as we're here on Saturday evening. Um, Vesna, you know, I love you. I am so excited to see you in London. Um, for all our Canadian paddlers and everybody here that is gunning for world sprints, um, they are on. Um, they've got enough intent entries in entries that uh, that we're going to go. So you're going to be seeing some stuff come out next week about Team Canada. And uh, Eric or Ron, do you want to share the big news about it's on our core schedule, but I don't think we've officially announced it yet. Well, there there are two uh, sprint events coming up. The first is uh, a Fairway Gorge's uh, Can You Hack It on March the 6th. But the bigger one that Leanne is alluding to is the Cora Sprint Nationals, which um, Cora has taken on this year and will be hosting it at Burnaby Lake, uh, just outside of Vancouver on, uh, on what dates? Uh, April, April 30th and May 1st, right? That's it, yeah. Um, and uh, that'll be a full, a full slate of OC6 and uh, V1 racing. So uh, that will lead people right into world sprints. And uh, Leanne's really happy about that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> of course I am. And for those folks that have, are FaceTiming me and messaging me right now, as far as trials go, we did have our registration back in the fall. Our core IVF meeting team is going to be meeting. Um, so there, we may or may not reopen registrations, but there are trials scheduled for tentatively for Calgary, May 14th, 15th. But we'll see how the core nationals plays into it. So game on. The biggest thing is get training if you haven't already. As Vesna said, you know, make sure you're starting with some of that base work um, so that you're not jumping right in. And I don't know what else to say. I am so excited. And yeah, I can't wait. Eric, any final words from you? Uh, yep. Uh, I just want to really thank Vesna as, a, as an avid sort of sprinter who's going to be racing next uh, weekend in Victoria at Can You Hack It? Uh, I want to just sort of revamp our entire race strategy 
<laughs> to, to match what I just learned today. So it's like, uh oh, we only have so many practices left. So I really had a great time. For those of you who have friends that you think would have benefited from this session, it will be uh, available on the Quora website uh, probably by tomorrow uh, at tomorrow afternoon. So the entire uh, workshop will be on the website and we'll send out a note to everybody in terms of the website and on Facebook uh, that it's uploaded and ready to go. So I would encourage you to share it with your teammates because it may, well, I'm pretty much sure it will, uh, improve your race strategy for 500 meter sprints and for other sprint formats as well. And uh, I know Vesna won't be here, at least not over the next few months, uh, but many of us on the Quora board looks for, look forward to seeing you at Can You Hack It and then at the national sprint uh, event at Burnaby Lake. So Vesna, once again, thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks to Ron and Leanne and Val and uh, Jonathan and the other board directors. We hope to see you at the next town hall uh, probably next month. And I think we can uh, go on to dinner now and Vesna can go on to afternoon tea. Thank, so thanks well. very much, Vesna. And I think, everybody. Eric, I think uh, as a heads up, I think we had decided that the next town hall would be crew selection, I believe. What a, gr what a great idea. <laughs> I, know, I, I thought that's what we had decided. Anyways, so the next town hall will be crew selection sometime uh, in March. And th thanks again, Vesna. We're looking forward to uh, speaking with you again at some point in the future. Uh, All right. Could I just say, um, can I send a survey through? Because I'd really like to get some feedback from everybody on how it went today. And feel free to visit my website, internationalpaddlingcoach.com. All right, Vesna. Vesna, we'll make... Vesna, we'll make your survey available uh, on our website tomorrow. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.